All right. We're getting started now. Welcome everybody to our informational call on the Collaborative Leadership Certification Program, Level 1. I'm Rebecca and I'm the communications wizard here at Round Sky Solutions. And just to orient us into the space in case you this is your first time getting connected with us, I will tell you a little bit about Round Sky. So Round Sky is a worker-owned cooperative that works with leaders who value inclusion and participation in their teams and who are seeking to improve their democratic and collaborative processes and also hone in on their leadership potential. And we do that through courses, coaching, and team or company-based trainings grounded in our collaborative operating system and processes, which we call CoLab. And you'll hear more about that system throughout this call. And um, that's, that's who we are, so welcome. If, you're, if that's the first time you're hearing about us, please feel free to ask questions later. And now moving to logistics about this call, if you have any questions, you can use the chat box, which you'll find in the toolbar. There's an area with a speaking bubble image on it, which you can click to enter your questions and comments. And if you're on the phone, which I think um, one person is here, you can unmute yourself and ask questions aloud as well. Uh, there will be time at the end. And if you have any technical issues, also use the chat box and you can chat directly to me, Round Sky Rebecca, and I can help try to help you work those out. And the call will be recorded and shared with everyone after this meeting as well. Great. So now I want to give us a little bit of space to get to know who's on the call. And I'll go ahead and start off with myself personally, personally and call on you all one by one. Um, so I'm Rebecca. I'm the communications wizard here at Round Sky. And what brought me to this work is the importance of process and structure to get us where we want to be. And I also wanted to enter more fully into the worker co-op movement, an understanding of what economic justice looks like for me as I come from a fragmented class background. And I currently live and have been in New Orleans for about four years, originally from California. And outside of Round Sky, I do anti-racist organizing with a collective, play volleyball, and try to make time for dancing. So I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation today because collaborative leadership has come up in many contexts throughout my life and when it's not working it really um, isn't and it's been pretty uncomfortable to figure out how to move forward with teams that I care about the people with um, so excited to talk about this with you all and I also recently completed the level one uh, training at the end of 2017 so I'm excited to t keep talking about this with you all and what humanizing leadership looks like. So now I'll invite Cecile to introduce herself and then each of us will say hello as well. Nice, thank you, Rebecca. So yeah, welcome everyone. It's great to see you. I am one of the co-founders of Round Sky Solutions. I live near Montpelier, Vermont. And I've been a social entrepreneur for 30 years. And during that time, I've had the opportunity to participate in a lot of different kinds of organizational environments from very small to rather large. And essentially motivated by the waste of time and energy and creativity that poor collaborative leadership represents, I was inspired to take up a deep dive into organizational and individual development in search of an answer and in particular, I was really curious what power is and developed some theories about power to map or explain the dynamics that I commonly saw in organizations. And I synthesized this research with uh, my uh, career experiences and created a map of what organizations are already communicating about and a set of processes uh, called CoLab that reliably delivers healthy forms of power in action, including much more fun and engaging uh, experiences of collaborative leadership. I published Collaboration That Works, a ruthlessly practical handbook for a generative world as a training manual that summarizes the research and introduces CoLab for organizations. Back to you, Rebecca. Great, thanks, Cecile. So I'd love to hear from everyone on the call to let us let us know your name, uh, which organization, if you are a part of one, you're coming from, the place that you live, and what brought you to this call today, including any questions that you might have. 
So uh, I'll go ahead and call on you one by one just for clarity. And I'm going to go down my list here. Julia, would you be willing to start us off? You'll have to um, unmute yourself. Thank you. <coughs> yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Julia Curry. I live in Burlington, Vermont. Um, so I came across Colab um, in the process of working with cooperatives across the state. Uh, my background is that I've been doing various types of organizing and collaborative work for about 20 years. So um, for the past decade, I have worked for a nonprofit organization, Champlain Housing Trust, and my little niche is that I coordinate a program of housing cooperatives, um, which is really fascinating <clears throat> and is a great laboratory for, <laughs> for seeing all the problems that can happen when groups try to work together, um, as well as really amazing achievements. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, I worked uh, in various types of organizing. I was a union organizer for about five years. Uh, I did faith-based interfaith organizing. I did community organizing. Um, so I am really, I would say, driven by um, <clears throat> the desire to help people who tend to be marginalized or have less power uh, get more power <laughs> over, you know, key aspects of their lives, but in a... Mm -hmm in a healthy way and, and really um, in a way that enables people's, you know, development of their human potential. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's what, that's kind of at the deepest level, what really sparks me. Yes. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so, so, you know, I, I see my own limitations working with groups. I get to see other people's limitations in working with groups as well as seeing, you know, high skill levels and, and people who are masters and freaking wondering, well, how do we get from here to there, <laughs> right? And how do we do that as a group? Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, outside of, outside of thinking about that, um, I love, you know, living here where there's a nice balance of the man-made and the, and the, you know, natural. <laughs> um, and getting outside and, gardening and, and I'm very um, tied into the community and really appreciate that. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks for introducing yourself. Jan, would you go next? Hi, everybody. Hi, Caitlin. I do remember uh, meeting you on a previous call. I'm in Boston and I'm a learning and development professional. I'm uh, deeply interested in organizational systems. And from that vantage point as an L&D person, developer, designer, and uh, facilitator, I worked in a large corporation where I got the opportunity to build programs, training leaders and managers, and was just um, appalled at, my observation of the dysfunction and the waste of, of the passion and potential that people are just hungry to give. So I um, expanded my, my skill set by taking a year uh, at actually Julia Champlain College, uh, did their, organiza their positive organizational certification program that I loved. Uh, and and so I'm, I'm all my work now is very grounded in appreciative inquiry and positive psychology. So when I discovered uh, collab, you know the I just was so it, it just seemed to plug in to all of the places that I saw so many needs mm -hmm. in leadership and um, organizational communications. So I'm, I would say that I am a leader myself in terms of the teams that I lead in learning projects. And, um, you know, as soon as I start to use any of Colab's processes, they just, they're just miraculous. So I also have completed the level one. And I have, will have lots more to say about that. But uh, that's, that's an overview of me. Thank you. Well, thanks. Welcome. Thanks for being here. 
nice to hear um, more about your journey. Caitlin, would you introduce yourself? My name is Caitlin. I live in the Burlington, Vermont area. Um, this is my 10th year in Vermont. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I'm a part of a bunch of organizations uh, for which I do all volunteer work. I don't have any paid work right now. Um, I kind of aspire to be paid for facilitation work. Um, I had a, an, an early, uh, done a lot of organizing work throughout my life. And uh, in high school, I was that overachiever that was part of just about every organization at school. Um, but when we did, when we got together a county level envir uh, environmental organization, um, uh, I could easily, uh, you know, learn the names of all 60 people in the room and connect everyone's ideas. And um, I, I pretty early on discovered that I loved facilitating. I later worked for the, uh, the Atlanta Project and the America Project at the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library, Presidential Center. And we did some, um, we got together some leaders in community development work around the country and had them write a book with all of them writing simultaneously and able to write uh, and, and pull up each other's writing and edit at the same time. And that was before Google Docs as we know it. And it made quite an impression on me 20 years ago. Um, and I thought, that's what I want to do. Uh, so I've kind of been looking at uh, facilitation programs since then and uh, been following Round Sky Solution for about seven, five, five years maybe, um, hoping to get in on the facilitator training. Um, I, I'm not convinced I need the training. And I think my main question is, uh, when are the next set of dates? Like, what are the dates of the program for the summer? And are you running the program in the fall? Like, I've seen, I think, all the other promotional materials. I know I need to apply by the 20th for whenever the next dates are. But uh, I, I'm kind of curious about what I'm committing to in terms of FaceTime and then homework time. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and I guess, finally, I have to apologize, but I probably need to get off the call in a few minutes. So, <laughs> um, uh, you, won't, you won't be able to address my question in the, uh, right now, but I'm sure I'll talk to Rebecca or Cecile or, or Jan or Julia. You'll fill me in. I, I'd love to talk to either of you about, about your thoughts on the program and what you hope to learn from it. So. Great. That's all. Awesome. We definitely will answer that. And the short answer is the level one starts, the summer cohort starts um, July 16th and last 10 weeks. And I'll follow up with you to give you the information that, um, the rest of that information. Thanks for joining us, at least for the intro. Great, and I think we have Nicole. Would you introduce yourself? And you'll have to unmute, yeah. All right, <clears throat> let's see, can you hear me? I'm using yes. my headphones, okay, cool. Hello, my name is Nicole. Um, <clears throat> I work at a nonprofit in Oakland called Planting Justice. Mm -hmm. uh, we work with folks coming home from San Quentin Prison. We run three sustainable enterprises in the environmental justice sphere. So we run an organic certified commercial nursery. We ship plants all over the country. We run a permaculture design build landscaping company. Um, and we have an urban farm as well. And all of the folks who work on our programs are formerly incarcerated folks and um, system impacted people, folks. And I, um, I have, I actually first found about Ron, out, found out about Ron Sky pretty recently from the Founders Syndrome um, mm -hmm. series of workshops, which might give you a little bit of context as to some of the things that I struggle with in where I work. Um, I, I signed up for them, but I haven't actually watched, had a chance to watch them yet, but I'm definitely looking forward to that. And um, I have a really unique set of challenges in that, um, I guess this is kind of one of my, one of the questions I have is how does this training address and work with folks with very different class and educational backgrounds on my team. I have folks without any computer literacy. I have folks who don't speak English as a first language or don't speak English at all. I have, you know, folks who been, have been to college, folks who haven't been to college, totally different approaches to like accountability, communication, even the specific tools. You know, we can't use email as a communication tool because not everyone has it and uses it. 
Um, so it's a lot of barriers for um, creating a culture of accountability and it's really hard. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. And um, I wrote your question down and we'll, that, we'll definitely get into how, how that could intersect with this training or how we see that intersect with that, this training. Um, great. Welcome everybody. So, so great to be in a virtual room with you all talking about what's, um, what's at the heart of our work and leadership and what's on our minds so that we can do this better. So thanks for opening up in that way. Um, so what we'll do today is um, really get into all the details about this program and I'm going to pass it off to Cecile to discuss that a little bit more about what we're doing today. I'm kind of jumping around. Nice. Yeah, thanks Rebecca and great to meet you all. Um, and thanks for making time to be here. So today, yeah, we definitely will talk a little bit about the benefits and challenges of, of collaborative leadership and why, why it's important and uh, what's brought each of us to this place of recognizing that collaborative leadership is, is critical. And uh, first, we'll start by looking at, you know, why is collaborative leadership important, including hearing from our current and former students um, on this call, Jana and um, Julia and Jan. And then we'll also look at the details of, of the course, along with logistics and pricing and deadlines and dates and all that. And we will also have an open Q&A at the end. So uh, the questions you've raised so far are fantastic. Uh, we'll definitely address those in the Q&A. And if you have more questions, do feel free to use that chat box, or we'll open the line at the end um, during the Q&A. So on that note, let's, let's talk a little bit about why collaborative leadership, uh, you know, uh, that's essentially what we're all here for and getting workable collaborative leadership for ourselves and our teams can be really challenging uh, as you know as Nicole just highlighted and 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 many of us have experienced uh, especially in this day and age with so many competing and complex demands uh, it could be perhaps that the t workload of your team is uneven or maybe there are really important details being dropped or maybe it's unclear who's doing what on a team and that's creating frustration and conflict. Or maybe you have a founder that's ready to retire and don't, don't really know how to do that. Uh, so I'd like to start with this question of why collaborative leadership as a form of leadership is so important by asking Julia and Jan, uh, what helped you realize that developing your own collaborative leadership was important to you? And I'll, I'll start with you, Julia. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I think the, the first thing that helped me realize this was just becoming, was when I got into organizing work, you know, and so I was in a milieu of talking and thinking about how do you help people gain more power? And, um, you know, it, it, eventually became really clear to me that my behaviors, my own behaviors were not helping people gain power. I was, I didn't know how to share power. Um, and so I was in the, you know, standing in the way of my own goals. Um, so that's probably the, the biggest trigger <laughs> to kind of getting on that path of like, Oh, okay, well then what do I do? Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Thank you. And how about you, Jan? <laughs> I love Rebecca's phrase, humanizing leadership. Yeah, the, the waste and dysfunction that just goes straight to my heart is this sense of when power is misused, people don't feel safe. Yeah, and there's so much um, in the system, the way the system is designed that uh, just makes it impossible for individuals, even, even groups of individuals to help that, to, to move that forward. You might trust one leader, one manager, but the system isn't safe, even if your leader is. So it was, it was just so clear to me that there needs to be a way for us all to participate and be heard that 
that feels like a safe space to do that. And um, I belong to an organization that uses Holacracy as its primary operating system. And it's still missing a humanizing element that I have found in Colab. I had an opportunity yesterday at a professional meeting to respond to a gentleman who said, oh my God, Holacracy, it's just like, wow, I can't believe it. And I said, okay, <laughs> wait till I tell you about Colab. <laughs> that started a conversation. Uh, so that's, that's what has, has made it for me, made it uh, powerful about the course. Mm. I've, it's helped me to, to grow in understanding, um, Julia, the, the aspects of power mm. and, and, and discern them, you know, be more uh, insightful about power dynamics and to introduce ways of operating that I've learned in CoLab that can make all the difference. Thanks, Jan. Yeah, so from my own perspective, I, I think encountering collaborative leadership as a concept, while I too have been sort of intuitively immersed in this desire to lead collaboratively for my entire adult life, I, I too found myself sort of up against my own ways of leading that were in, in my own way and in the way of my, my teams being able to, to share power and, and um, uh, lead together. And that uh, took me, you know, frankly, many decades to sort of come to, come to terms with the fact that there was a thing here. There was, there was a new way of being as a leader that was possible that our co current culture did not teach us and did not support, essentially. Um, and so for me, some of the sort of highlights that really, um, that really struck me as I went through my journey as a social entrepreneur, the things that really sort of highlighted the fact that collaborative leadership was much more effective and efficient besides being much more human and fulfilling for all of us is uh, simple things, even like uh, missed opportunities, you know, and it, it, whether it was a hierarchical team or a team that was trying to operate collaboratively, this, 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 the fact that we could miss opportunities um, when working together uh, that would cost our organization was, was painful. And so, it, it, you know, it, it costs our organizations both, you know, financially and in terms of credibility. Um, another one that really struck me was the amount of invisible work that happens. And frequently, honestly, it's done, done by the women uh, on a team, uh, not always, but, but that invisible work, work that's not acknowledged, not supported, not um, appreciated, uh, you know, this creation of unequal distribution of work across organizations and people not feeling appreciated. And, and then the counterpart of that is the same time you have people who both overwork and then those who try to actively hide from and, and try to get away with doing as little as possible. Um, you know, for frankly, one nonprofit that we worked with was surprised to find that a key worker in the organization was doing a tremendous amount of work, right? And that other folks had really no idea about. And discovering the fact that all this work was happening made it possible for the team to redistribute that work more equitably. Um, and that person in question was obviously able to feel seen and appreciated. And an, another really common challenge I, I encountered in, in my years as a leader is this, this question of, of burnout and resentment. Uh, if you have some people who are working harder than others and getting more done, um, because they're actually capable, their ability to perform, right, to be a high-performing individual becomes a detriment to them, actually. In our current reality of our world and cultural busyness, we really need tools to prevent burnout and actively nurture each other. So those are a few of the highlights for me of why collaborative leadership became really important. There are certainly others, you know, working in, in highly top-down organizations, the disempowerment that comes from, you know, putting all of this great work out there and only to have it either, you know, completely cut off by an autocratic leader or not, not used. Um, and to have that happening over and over again is, is deeply, uh, you know, disempowering. 
uh, for, for folks, myself included. And, and that leads, of course, to burnout and resentment as well. But, um, but there are similar challenges that come from working in collaborative environments. Um, so I, what I discovered is that both hierarchical and more collaborative environments have their unique challenges, but they both relate back to the same question of what is power and how do we use it. And so the question um, on my mind right now is just how does the collaborative leadership certification program help with these particular kinds of challenges and, and others? Um, and, and both uh, Jan and Julia have had a chance to take um, the level one collaborative leadership certification program. And I'd love to hear from you, you know, what has been most powerful for, for you about the course? How has it changed your leadership? How have you grown so far? And I'll start with you again, Julia. Thanks. Um, so let's see. You know, I came to um, learning CoLab um, primarily for the housing cooperatives that I advise and support, right? So <clears throat> they look to me for advice and resources and strategies. <laughs> and uh, I, needed, I needed more than what I had. You know, I definitely could identify, um, I can identify the challenges, uh, but that doesn't automatically tell me, you know, what's gonna be a good fit for solutions. So, <clears throat> um, doing, you know, learning CoLab, um, I would say there are really particular elements of the whole system that um, address some of the kind of recurring or most common pain points, you know, that I see in the housing cooperatives. Um, and those include, first of all, just the, the just, <laughs> uh, the role development, you know, <laughs> I say just because when you read it, you're like, duh, of course, <laughs> it, it seems self-evident and yet <laughs> people don't do it, right? It's not. No. Um, so that uh, strikes me as one um, tool that, you know, that, that offers a, a, like a great payoff, you know, sort of a great starting point for my groups um, in terms of what, you know, what they'll get out of that um, for the, compared to the work it will take them. Um, <clears throat> Likewise, the, the element of the, the decision-making process, um, integrative consent um, offers a, a couple things in combination that I think are very powerful. You know, there's just a very clear um, process that gives everyone time to talk. <laughs> and again, it's fascinating how that seems like it should be self like a self-evident thing to do and is not um, because it's not the dominant, you know, cultural mode that that we all have absorbed, right? Mm -hmm. um, so combining that that opportunity for people to really weigh in, um, not just opportunity, but invitation, with um, an equally clear standard for making, you know, for, for, for making that final decision. Um, so, so a lot of what I find appealing about Collab overall is that it really combines, it, it's so well thought through. Um, you know, so, so it, the processes really do, I would say, maximize participation and efficiency mm. <laughs> at the same time. And so often those feel like mutually exclusive, you know, trade-offs. Um, so that's powerful. It's, it's not simple to learn, right? So I think that um, for my folks, because they're not working together daily, you know, they are meeting once a month. Uh, it's definitely a case where we are picking a few morsels and saying, let's work on this and see how long it might take people to absorb um, before we were to, you know, think about moving on to, to some other pieces. But um, all of those elements, I mean, it, it's just, it's been fascinating to me to, to really see, in addition to those concrete pieces, um, some of the, the, just the thinking, the orientation and the principles behind the system uh, have been very helpful to me you know, one being, again, just like have a clear standard for decisions, <laughs> right? Hey, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. and, and have it be explicit, right? So that leads to this, the, one of the really fundamental principles that power flows through communication. This is one that I have found, you know, that I come back to again and again, mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that just, again, crystallizes, you know, kind of my intuition, but in a way that I can share it with other people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, 
especially like I have a lot of folks I work with who are, uh, you know, kind of get her done process averse types. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think there's definitely, there can definitely be a class element there in terms of, you know, some of my more uh, middle class, you know, professional work folks um, take to meeting process like ducks to water and some of the people who, you know, do not work in professional environments and, you know, come from, um, you know, more of a, a less formally educated, more working class background, you know, some, some of those folks can just be very impatient with this stuff. So it's really helpful to have ways to name, you know, here's why we're doing this. Here's what we're going to get out of it. Here's why it's worth the time and energy. Um, so that's been great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julia. How about you, Jan? <clears throat> I love what Julia said about addressing the pain points. <laughs> yeah, there, there were and still are so many pain points in the uh, kind of, of organizations that I've given my, my passion time to, my discretion time to. And those organizations as a whole seem stuck in a green stage if any of you have a sense of you know the the various stages in um, spiral dynamics and and frederick lalu and um, but it's about consensus there seems to be this built-in if we don't all agree on exactly the same thing and we we can't move forward and there is a stuckness every decision seemed to be endless and <laughs> so collab processes have have broken up that log jam with a couple of really well thought out um, concepts as well as you know practical processes what the co the concept that's most useful to the teams I work on is is it minimally sufficient for moving forward now can we all agree that this is worth trying, knowing that we can come back and, and change it at any time? And boy, does that free people up. <laughs> also, the, the way that the agenda, the living agenda is structured and the processes that are built into it around um, action. It's not, it's, we're not there for having discussions. We're there for turning our discussions into outputs and getting that and, and focusing on that and realizing that it's not about talking it to death. It's about just figuring out what is it that we are, ta are, are wanting to do together and how do we shape that next realistic step, that next action. So those are, those are so empowering. They, along with integrative consent, which Julia mentioned, they empower everybody on the team to contribute their, their part and to say how they feel. And they're also, their, their participation is acknowledged because they can object or not object to that small next step. So yes, it's about if empowering people in an efficient way. We're getting things done. I also like that and this is something that I emphasize when I tell people about the difference between holacracy and collabs processes is that Cecile studied so many of these um, next stage uh, frameworks and the integral framework and the um, immunity to change framework have contributed to making personal development and inner interpersonal um, relationships integral to all the practices mm -hmm. so that people don't feel as though this is, this is only engaging a part of me. It's about engaging all of me. And of course, in, a, in an organization that purports to, to be about purpose, wholeness, and self-management, or the, the three you know, keys in, uh, in Lalu's thinking, 
it's all it's there wholeness is is built in to all of the practices and there are specific practices that are that are focused on the the personal and the interpersonal but they're woven they're all woven together and i won't say that the teams i'm working on are very sophisticated in using all of them all the processes yet we're still making our way through but like Cecile frequently says, it's, we're learning a new language. We're learning to speak and operate in a new way. And it's okay for it to be uncomfortable at first, for it to take time, for, it to, um, for everyone to understand and, and use it. But from the outset, they've, they've taken it to their heart because they can see the potential just in using a living agenda and having the integrative uh, consent process. So um, I, th I think I've gone so far afield that I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> Did I answer it? Thank you, thank you, Jan. Yes, it was, how, what was most powerful for you about the course and, and how it's changed your leadership? The only other thing I'd say is the, the power of the course is getting a chance to use the practices mm. while you're in the class. Mm putting it to practical use so incredible thanks jan yeah and rebecca did you want to add anything from your perspective and experience with the course sure i can do that i think what both a lot of what both julia and jan resonates with me and the the question the thought around um some people liking or feeling more accustomed to meeting practices and processing and some others uh, haven't been like maybe even conditioned to do that um, through through their workplace and I think that's really I think the tools in the course speak to um, multiple like can be used in multiple frameworks so it's what I got out of the course is really this the challenge to be clear in in a conversation in a meeting and know when the when it's over like know how to make a decision and know that a decision has been made and just in a very clear way i think is super helpful because the the parts that get people impatient is the constant back and forth of in your in the idea that you're never ever going <laughs> to make a decision so i think that part um, that clarity around decision making and around conversations and what kind of output you're looking for really help to streamline that process um, in in a setting where consensus could go forever possibly so or there's the fear of that yeah. I think that's that's a really helpful thing that I take with me in meetings and beyond and then also on the same on that same kind of line, this sense of being able to listen and hone in on what people are actually asking or articulating in a meeting is is a, is a skill that I learned through through the course and through the tools in the course, like pinpointing, okay, this person is saying this, and um, this other person is saying this. Like, what what actually needs to happen here, and what how do I really listen and, and figure out how to navigate these different perspectives um, in the way that in the way that I want to facilitate a team or my, a meeting? So I think that's two of the challenges, really listening and being clear about what's next mm -hmm. are two benefits that I got out of the program. Thanks, Rebecca. So, uh, lots more territory to explore about um, collaborative leadership, but I think we'll dive into uh, talking about what goes into the course a little bit and, um, and then have some time for some Q&A here. So in, in particular, 
what we cover in this course is you'll, you'll get a chance to concretely learn uh, your, and nurture your team's culture of accountability uh, by both naming leadership and giving people healthy power over, over their work, right? And, and part of this takes building up your own personal skills as a leader and then also adding tools to your leadership toolbox that work for the whole team in terms of how to create a generative, healthy, and powerful uh, leadership for everyone on the team. And uh, this program really is, it's remote, so you can attend virtually from wherever you are in the world for leaders, coaches, consultants, um, visionaries who understand the importance of democratic and participatory leadership and management, but yet, you know, are, are seeking more concrete uh, practices and tools for them to use and to be able to see and address the power dynamics and hierarchies in your team um, that no one knows how to talk about or wants to talk about. Um, but to be able to actually talk about that and to build up leadership that's generative rather than dominating. So as Rebecca shares the course page with you um, to find the information for each session, I'll share some highlights um, from each of the sessions. Um, we have 10 sessions as Julie, as, sorry, Rebecca mentioned, we start on the week of July 16th. And first session is really an orientation and we'll begin to talk about the big picture components, the maps, so to speak, of the territory that, that we then apply to our current situations. Um, in session two, we look at integrating life-changing facilitation. You will get introduced to this, this practice that we call the standard meeting practice, which is um, really learning effective processes for knowing what you and your team need in any situation and how you're going to get there. Uh, and the, the skills for facilitating lots of different kinds of agenda items and kinds of conflicts that might come up for you as a team. Session three, we begin to look at uh, this, this idea of self-management. What is it? What goes into it? How does the team align around what that means for everyone on a team? And to point back to one of Nicole's questions at the beginning is like, how do you work with a team that is really all over the place in terms of skills, abilities, and even access to resources like a computer? Um, so that, that ability to align around our expectations of what self-management is and how it works for our team in particular is, is the basis of, of where this session begins and will concretely also dig into your own personal ability to self-manage as a leader because that is, it is critical that we build up our own capacities in order to be able to teach others as well. Session four, we'll dig into collaborative decision-making. Um, what is it? How do we do it? What do we deal with? You know, how do we deal with conflict that arises inevitably during the process of making decisions? How do we take different and even conflicting perspectives and weave them together into a decision that's actually stronger and better and more workable for the team? Session five, we dig into mapping your team, really understanding who is doing what and uh, what it means to confer authority to another person on the team. How, how does that actually work in action day to day? And creating really the foundation for us to be accountable back to each other. Um, and the, 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 these processes, both articulating and, and conferring power and then being accountable back for that which we have power over, uh, make it possible to, you know, take the traditional forms of oppression in workplaces um, and, and make things much more functional and healthy. Session six, we dig into this question of collaborative accountability. What is it? How do we do this? And how do we do this in a way, again, that's not oppressive, but is uh, mutually supportive and, and um, uplifting? Session seven, we really begin to ask this question about how do we implement this in our environments? How do we, what kinds of questions are we coming back with from our teams about how to put this into action? And we take that to, into even deeper levels in session eight, where we're looking at specific scenarios from your situation and troubleshoot how to put these into action. Session nine, we'll look at uh, the more particulars of facilitation. So we'll circle back to particular tips and tricks for facilitation, managing unhealthy power dynamics in the moment, 
And we'll also look at um, some of the bigger picture questions of uh, any organization faces like our purpose, our business model, our strategy, um, how we manage interpersonal conflict, and also personal development conversations. And our last session is about integrating, um, taking what you've learned and creating an implementation plan for yourself and your organization. So the key um, piece here is that while we'll present you with both some big picture ideas and some very practical tools, the, the key integration from the course comes from applying this in your environments and bringing back your learning about how that's going and your questions um, and um, learning how, how to use Collab through doing it. So I will pass it off to Rebecca to talk about our particular learning projects and activities that you'll have during the course. Great, thanks Cecile. That's a lot of information, that's for sure. And I like to think of the course as having two different tracks, a management and tools track, and also a more personal development and skills track, that there's two things happening here. And I like to think of those in those five, these five projects. So the first one is this personal development topic, which is really diving into um, what is, what's on your mind about what, where do you want to make the biggest improvement and really focusing in on what, where your area of growth is. And then throughout the course, we, um, we come back to that and, and think of different ways about how you can continue to work on this, this topic for yourself, this area of growth. That's the first, the first thing. Um, and there's a lot of accountability wrapped up in that then that you can use in your own, in your own teams. And then you'll have a personal task tracking project. So whether you have a system already in place um, or you don't, we'll up, you'll upgrade that to a tracking system that better meets your needs and continuously creating a way so that you can be accountable to yourself and then mirror that for others and, and really be organized so that your, um, your top projects are getting attention. And, to, and how to prioritize those. And then you'll have your scopes and roles project and that is mapping out your organization and who's doing what and really understanding the um, difference between who needs, who can make a decision individually and who makes a collective decision. And this project helps you figure that out for your team and, and um, get clarity on it for everyone, not just for yourself. And then there is your your project tracking, which is taking your personal tracking project to the team level and understanding how, how does your team um, track their projects together? How do you continue, how do you have a, a self-organized team that's accountable without a boss um, having one-on-one -on -one check ins? So really honing in on collaborative accountability through this project. And then you'll have a chance to um, really dive into introducing and onboarding your team so that you know what are the key steps to getting getting some of what you've learned um, integrated into your team and how do you get people on board that might not be completely thrilled about changing their whole system up um, but you know that it will have big impacts for you so those are your five projects and through those I want to share some of those top highlights that you'll work toward in the course. And as a recent graduate, I can share what really stood out for me and what continues to stand out for me. And the top one for me really is this grounded and intentional leadership. And so through piecing together what I've been working on before this, before this, my work at Round Sky and my work in this certificate course and everything in the course I've been able to hone in on what makes me an intentional and grounded leader what are those key pieces for me and part of that is through a somatic development project and through other various tools and getting really important feedback and then the other is strengthening as I said earlier um, to Cecile's question is strengthening my how I facilitate collective decision making, how you facilitate collective decision making. So it doesn't last forever. So it's very clear. It's important to get everyone's um, perspective in, but it's not important necessarily to get everyone to agree, just to agree, just to 
consent to trying something. So there's there's these key these key frameworks that and just shifts in thinking that can be really helpful in your facilitation. And then another thing is facilitating productive meetings. And this is um, not the sexiest of of uh, big highlights for me, but how I'm in meetings all the time, and it's pr proven to be very, very, very helpful for myself within meetings that Colab isn't even used, but I'm just facilitating as um, someone with these tools. So productive meetings, understanding what it what a good meeting can feel like um, with both humanizing leadership, as we mentioned earlier, and getting things done. So always finding, trying to find a balance for that, but um, a little closer. And then getting effective accountability. So Cecile had mentioned burnout and resentment earlier, often comes out of these ineffective ways that we're working together. I think um, all, I can't, I don't know anyone who hasn't heard of burnout or hasn't felt burnout at some point. And I think figuring out for ourselves a way to be accountable without burnout is really important. And so this is one of the things that um, is touched upon as well in the course. So that's one of the highlights for me. And then using these skills over and over again. They're just so um, versatile in lots of ways. So with that, I'll pass it back to Cecile to share about what's included in the program and some more of the um, details. Thank you, Rebecca. So yeah, the course includes, um, along with our weekly live training calls uh, with a certified instructor to get instruction and support with your collaborative leadership facilitation and the implementation of these tools in your team, you'll also get the instruction manual and card deck and, uh, and also a connection to a, a, a learning community of uh, mission-driven leaders like yourself. And uh, our cohorts are small. They're designed especially to enable you to connect with your, your peers and um, share your learning with each other. You'll also get personalized feedback um, on your leadership and facilitation and receive practical templates and training in how to build responsive and dynamic uh, collaborative teams. You also have access to our online course platform and forums where you can discuss your, your learning and receive feedback. And you'll get certified as a Colab Level 1 facilitator, uh, which you can add to your resume and uh, supporting your work as a professional. So you can go to our Round Sky Solutions CLCP1 page for more information and to apply. And uh, back to you, Rebecca, on course logistics and pricing. Great. So this will get some of the questions from earlier about dates and commitments. So the, as Cecile said, the cohorts are are meant to be intimate, um, deep spaces. So they're small of three to five, three to six people. And you'll meet with them for 10 weeks starting July 16th and um, via video, via Zoom, like we're on right now. And they last for about two, two hours a week. So that um, is, is how long the program is. And then you'll have the opportunity to get to facilitate and then receive coaching on that during those sessions and as well as scribing because information is is power as we as I think that Julia said earlier and so or communication is power so how we communicate what happened in the meeting is important and then um, you'll also have access to a course platform with all the materials you'll have a chance to demonstrate how you've integrated them throughout the course weekly really and um, you can expect to spend about three to five hours a week, including the two hour sessions, depending on um, what kind of assignments are happening and also what type of, uh, how deep you go into them. So you, you could spend more hours, but three to five, I think is the average for how much you'll spend. And so the summer cohort starts the week of July 16th and the application deadline is June 20th. And the cost for the program program is $2,500. We do accept payment plans and if you're a Vermont resident, you may qualify for VSAC um, non-academic grant funding. So email us if you go ahead and apply and put it in there and email us and let us know 
that you'd like to apply for that and we can give you the details. And then we also have a referral policy. So if you know other people or if you have a team of people who want to do this, um, you can get part of their tuition towards yours as well. So we really are working hard to make this accessible, um, accessible for as many people as possible. And with that, um, we'll get to some of these Q and some of the questions that were mentioned earlier and then we'll wrap up. So how about we, um, I think we answered the dates and the commitment, but we'll, I'll just go ahead and say that again in case that's helpful. So starts July 16th, ends the week of September 17th. And so that's 10 weeks and meets weekly. And the time commitment is about three to five hours each week for that. And then we had one other question that perhaps Cecilia you wanna mention or touch on is how does the training support leaders who are working with others who come from many different class backgrounds, education backgrounds, um, tech familiarity, a team that some people don't use email to communicate. So how, how does the course translate into, is that help, will the course be relevant for that person will be helpful? So like this, and I'll, we'll start with you, Cecile. You're muted, by the way. Oof. There you go. That's, there we go. Awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. And the short answer to this is while the training is held online, the tools are totally applicable offline in offline environments. And uh, they essentially consist of a set of principles that translate to practices that we use during our meetings together that apply outside of the meetings. And so it's essentially about aligning the expectations of a team around what does it mean uh, to meet together and communicate, make decisions and be accountable. And that is uh, fundamentally uh, not, um, it, it's a fundamental difference between how autocratic environments operate, which is often um, at the discretion and the whim of, of whoever happens to be in charge, right? And so within CoLab, what we're doing is making all the rules of the game explicit and clear and rules of the game that once they're learned, the team itself can, can change and alter them to have them fit their environment more, more specifically. And so um, we do go over during the course uh, how to use these tools in offline environments if that's, if that's your situation. So what I find is that the action of making our communication processes and, and practices explicit and something that is owned by the whole team has a um, very powerful effect on um, equalizing across race, class, and different, you know, different backgrounds that we might be coming from that are non-technological, non perhaps. So that is, that is how the course will help you in, in your particular environment. Anything you want to add to that, Rebecca? I think I might just emphasize that the templates are on Google, but the concept is what's more important. The concept of facilitating and the processes of facilitating that you're integrating into your toolbox. And um, for example, um, our, our projects tracker, our ops tracker, that the ops tracker itself isn't actually the most important. It's the practice of continuously and regularly reporting out on what your projects are and knowing how to prioritize them. So if you have a big, big paper of people's names on top and what projects they are for the week, maybe on a sticky note, then, um, and you, we, you meet on that weekly or bi-weekly, whatever your situation is, that's sufficient. It doesn't have to be online. So I think but the concept of knowing to do that, to have self-organization is the really the key part there. Otherwise the template, if you don't know that the template isn't helpful. Yeah. So I just wanna say that there's, that there are a lot of tech things that are totally transferable to other ways of using them. I don't know if either of you, Julia or Jan wanna share um, I know you talked about this a little bit earlier, Julia. Yeah, and um, this issue definitely is a challenge in our co-ops, and I really see a divide between people who are, I, 
I guess, sort of uh, several people who are highly tech literate and who, you know, <clears throat> maybe already use um, Google a lot. You know, the, the schools are using it. So people with kids in the schools now are very used to going doing that. Um, so for those folks, it's kind of second nature. And then we have people who are, you know, on computers, but not super literate. And then we have people who uh, don't interact with, you know, computers at all. So I think for us, that is still a work in progress, but it's an area that I, that I, where I see these gaps and I, and I see where power is not flowing because information is not flowing, you know? Um, so I think again, like there isn't going to be a one size fits all answer for these groups, but it's really just being able to name to them like, Hey, here's, here's, you know, where there, where something is stuck. Here's why it matters. Let's pick the solution that's going to work for you. And you know, let's try this out, right? Let's try this out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great point. Wonderful. Well, um, that's all we have time for now. Oh, Jan, did you want to add something? Oh, I, no, I see that we're at the top of the hour. Just, uh, I guess I'm very fortunate that all the teams I'm working with are entirely virtual, so everybody's already pretty uh, technologically savvy. <clears throat> I'm remembering someone in my cohort who ha was under this, had the same problems that Julia has, and uh, Cecile gave some real um, positive and, and useful ideas to her. It might be interesting for them to connect and, and how, to, how to, see, to see how Carolyn had carried out some of her, uh, some of your suggestions. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, and great connection there. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate the time and energy that um, you all have put in here and we're excited to get this summer cohort going and get this recording out to them. So thanks. So yeah. Much. Thank, thanks all for being here. Really, really appreciate it. Good to connect. Thanks. Yes. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.